Okay. Um, so, uh, thought I'd open with a bang with a nice graphic here. A uh, bit of Russian constructivism adapted to illusionism. Uh, the thought was that illusionism, uh, well, it appears to some as a revolutionary doctrine. I, I, I don't, I don't think it's revolutionary. I think it's just standard common sense. But anyway, I thought I'd play along with the gag. So, uh, and actually, uh, now, how do I make this advance? Ah, it, uh, just tap. This is a definition. This is um, from the Constructivist Manifesto, 1923. This is a definition of the aims of constructivism, and I think there are certain overlaps. I don't distress them too far with illusionism. Uh, uh, the material formation of the object to be substitute of its aesthetic combination. Object to be treated as a whole. Uh, I'm not sure about the industrial order. I think. Um, technical mastery and organization of materials. So yes, there are some connections there. I don't want to stress them too far, but just don't say that. Okay. So what I'm going to do, actually, uh, that slide should have come after the introduction. introduction. What I want to do in this talk is I'm not going to defend illusionism. I'm going to outline some of the implications of illusionism. If you adopt the view, what follows? What practical uh, uh, consequences follow for the way we do various things, philosophy, science, the way we think about the ethics of consciousness and so on. And I'm going to do that for, and so I'm going to present some do's and don'ts for researchers in various fields. And all of those are spelled out on the handout. Each of these could probably do with a little lecture in itself, but I'm going to run through a lot of them quickly, just to give you a sense of the, the, the broad picture. And then we can we can go into some of them maybe later over the course of the of the workshop. Uh, and one of the reasons for doing this is to give you a better idea of what illusionism actually is. If any definition of it gets bogged down in questions about what exactly it is that illusionists are denying or claiming to be illusory. Uh, qualia, phenomenal properties, what it is likeness, how do we how do we get a grip on these? And it's not easy to get a grip on these notions, and that is part of the motivation for illusionism itself. So instead of getting bogged down in that, let's look at uh, what does it, you know, what does it come out to in, in cash value. Uh, what exactly illusionists, uh, so the difficulty in saying what the illusionists are denying, you can cash that out by looking at the recommendations that illusionists make. By their fruits shall ye know them. By the fruits of illusionism shall you know it. And also, uh, another aim is to pose a question for those people who are physicalists, but resist illusionism. Who think that illusionists have somehow gone too far or um, uh, 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 missed something out. Do they resist any of these recommendations? And if not, then it's just a matter of presentation and terminology uh, and emphasis and rhetoric rather than anything substantial. So it's to try to focus the issue a little bit between uh, illusionists and other physicalists. And that's the plan. I'm going to begin by giving a brief introduction to illusionism, a rather caricatured introduction, just to get us started. Um, a reminder for those who already know what it is, uh, an introduction, quick introduction for those who don't, uh, and which I thought might be useful for the, for the workshop as a whole. Uh, I'll try to keep that for about 10 minutes, and then I will trace through some implications, some recommendations, do's and don'ts for those five areas, philosophy, neuroscience, uh, animal consciousness, and AI, uh, and, and then ethics. I see this will all be very quick, but it will be it will be a starting point, I hope, for discussion that we can continue over the next two days. Okay, so let's have a start where the top of the slides is is obscured here. Don't know how to see, sorry. Oh, there's a comment in the chat, I see. Oh, never mind. Oh, that's great. Got it. So quick introduction to illusionism. Uh, so here we have uh, a sad looking person looking at an apple. Um, we're gonna start with experiences. Not going to start with what it is likeness with phenomenal, this phenomenal consciousness. Uh, what it is likeness, I'm not gonna start with that. I'm gonna start with just experiences which I take to be personal level states, 
that are recognizable in both the first person and the third person. They're states of seeing, of smelling, of tasting, hearing, feeling pain, uh, and so on and so on. You, you all know what experiences are. We can all recognize them and categorize them when they occur in us and when they occur in other people in pretty much the same sort of, well, exactly the same sort, but in, in a, a quite immediate way. When I have a, a pain, I just know that I'm having a pain. I don't have to reason it out. Similarly, much of the time, if you have a pain, I can just see it, that you're in pain. I don't need to infer in a, comp in a, in a explicit way from the data. I just see that you're in pain. Um, So we have these recognizable personal level states. They're real, there's no problem about that. The question is what, what, what's their nature? And one thing we know about these states is that they are very, speaking very broadly, they're complexes of informational and reactive processes. Everyone agrees on this. So caricaturing very much, what's happened? I seem to have lost the... Uh, Ah, here we go. So we have receptor cells that fire and send uh, signals to sensory processing regions of the brain, which construct representations of various aspects of the environment. Then we have attentional processes, which select some of that information for wider usage or global broadcast, if you like, to control systems, various kinds of brain, which then generate a host of reactions. Oh, it's about as simple as you could get, but that is the general picture. Reactions here, uh, I take the, the, the green arrows, the reactions, I take those to include folk psychological things, we categorize in folk psychological terms, beliefs, desires, emotions, memories, all sorts of things, but also a lot of stuff that escapes the folk psychological net, a lot of um, um, implicit stuff, like priming effects, broadly construed, all sorts of little changes in the micro settings of the brain, which will uh, shape how the next round of um, stimuli is processed and interpreted and the next round of reactions. Uh, so you could tell this story if you wanted in a, in a predictive coding kind of way. Um, and so let's characterize that even more crudely as, as a sort of cyclical process. Information coming in, reactions being generated. Most of these reactions, are, some of these reactions will be overt, will be behavioral, but I'm talking mainly about psychological ones and physiological ones too. Um, and that shapes how the next round of stimuli is processed. So you have a, something like a cyclical process like that. And I think pretty much everybody agrees in, I mean, that's so simplified and so caricature that I think pretty, pretty much everybody could agree that something like that's happening. And now, fine. And then the question is, is there something else happening? Uh, are these processes somehow producing introspectable mental qualities of some kind? Uh, the actual redness of the uh, uh, <laughs> the redness of the apple, of course, the poor old apple in the world there isn't really red. It's just got certain, stru certain structural properties, primary qualities, surface textures and so on that affecting light and certain kinds. The poor old apple isn't red, but the brain kind of fills it in, colors it in, uh, like a painting my numbers kit with the, the real redness. Uh, and these properties minimally, I was, I've been trying to think what's the minimal commitment to a, a, a phenomenal realist view. And I think it's that these properties being intrinsic in some sense, they're distinct from the informational and reactive processes. They may be playing informational roles, uh, they may be causing reactions, but they're not themselves just informational states, not themselves just reactions, there's something extra. And uh, all sorts of stronger claims are made from them, which I think are probably bound up with that basic commitment. Things like they're being private, they're being ineffable, they're being immediately uh, uh, apprehensible in uh, um, being, um, so I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time. Uh, they're being known in, a, in an epistemically privileged way with a certain kind of completeness and, and uh, certainty that, uh, uh, with a special kind of completeness and certainty. But anyway, we didn't get into that. Intrinsic will do as a, as a um, basic characterization. That's phenomenal realism. Illusionists deny these ex the existence of these experts. Deny phenomena. 
That's the negative part of illusionism. Uh, oh, what it is, what about what it is like us? <laughs> Are you denying what it is like us as well? Come back to that later because uh, I think we just get into a lot of linguistic messiness there that doesn't help us at all. Um, that's the negative aspect of illusionism. So far, it's just a form of qualia eliminativism, phenomenal eliminativism. Um, the positive side is that the um, is an attempt to give an explanation of why people are so tempted by phenomenal realism, why people are so inclined to believe in these extra features. So that's our original cycle of uh, 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 what I called, I think I would use the name, perceptual consciousness, information of the action of the first order. Uh, oh, what have I done? <laughs> this is a Mac and I, I, I use Windows, I'm afraid of. I've still got that thing there. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> uh, so so we've, we've already moved on to the next. Um, uh, but the idea here is here's roughly how you explain why people believe in uh, phenomenal properties, in these extra properties. And I think most illusionist accounts are going to have something like this shape. Again, it's going to be very crude. There are, the brain has self monitoring processes that model some aspect of perceptual consciousness. What aspect? Well, that's an open question. We'll call these properties, whatever they are that are being monitored, whichever aspect of this informational reactive cycle, whichever aspects are being monitored, I'll call them quasi-phenomenal properties. I think they're more on this side, on the side of the reaction. But they could be on this side. So I don't really see the point of monitoring this stuff. I see the point of monitoring that stuff, and I can explain that. But um, anyway, what it doesn't matter for the outline purposes. So these, and these are just patterns of neural activity. Nothing, um, no, no way distinct from the informational and reactive properties. They're just part of them, an aspect of them. And they're being monitored. Yes, I need to tap not press. Generating a new raft of reactions. Uh, reactions now to aspects of this rather than to aspects of the world. This, this, this is, uh, these are reactions to the apple. These are reactions to our reactions to the apple or to our uh, information about the apple. And that I call introspective consciousness. Using the word consciousness here in a, in a, uh, uh, in a functional sense, there's nothing, there's no implications of, uh, of, of phenomenal feel. Um, we could call it something else. It's awareness, it doesn't matter. But these self monitoring processes caricature the quasi phenomenal properties. They, they provide a schematic, simplified, distorted model of them that is adapted for the purposes of this introspect, of introspective consciousness, which is control and communication. It enables you to control, to some extent, your first order engagement with the world and also to communicate about it, to tell people how the world is affecting you. So here the world is affecting you. This stuff enables you to talk about how the world's affecting you and um, try to control it at a higher order level. And this creates what Daniel Bennett has called a user illusion. This is the user illusion. These are the things that are being monitored. And this, the effects of this are the user illusion, the, the, um, the appearance on the, on the computer desktop. This is the workings of the, the computer. The reactions at the top here are the desktop. So one of these, one of these, excuse me, the right of breath. One of these uh, reactions is the generation of phenomenal beliefs. Beliefs that this stuff has phenomenal properties, and phenomenal properties themselves are merely the intentional objects of those beliefs. That's that's the only place they exist is in the represented world. Of interaction. Um, and that's the illusion in illusion. Now, there are quite a few illusionists here, because there's a very prominent one here. Uh, I hope most of them will be pretty much on board with that picture. <laughs> I've got a thumbs up, I can go on. So, uh, much about the one through the other, but we can talk about this. So, let's say then that you, you, you buy that. You say, okay, all right, you can wait. I'm happy. What follows? 
what morals do we draw from that? Uh, that's it. Oh, sorry, I've got a nice, nice picture of this here. Sorry, just a summary picture of this. So this is a picture of consciousness as engagement with the world in the first instance. This is perceptual consciousness. These are information. And notice how the arrows go around the back. That's a little nod to the phenomenologist. You see. I've thought all, all diagrams through. <laughs> and it's engagement with the world and with our engagement with the world. We're not just engaged with the world, we're engaged with our engagement. And that's what generates the sense of there being this, this strange private in a world of phenomenal qualities that then send everybody off down a metaphysical uh, 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 pathway that branches out into all sorts of things. And by following that pathway, you end up with all sorts of uh, they're quite reasonable once you start off down that route. You end up believing that electrons are conscious or whatever. Uh, but what if you don't follow that? What if you accept that it is just these information reactive processes? What follows then? Right. Uh, we did start a bit late, didn't we? So I'm have to let me know if I if I run over. I've got a lot to say. So um, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Some of these I will just say things, do's and don'ts, and uh, I won't be able to defend them properly, but we can talk about them later. It was it's right at the beginning, so it's worth it. Down. Let's start with the implications for philosophy. Now, the first one I want to say is don't, this is actually a piece of homeopathy advice, don't deny that consciousness exists. Because if you do that, people will think you're saying that we're all blind and deaf and that we, we, that we, we, we don't feel pain and that we don't have emotions and we don't, and so on. And they will suggest that they would come up and smack you on the nose to, to prove that you're wrong and so on. It's just pointless denying that. Of course, consciousness exists. Experiences exist. That's where we started. These things are conscious experiences exist. You can recognize them. You can recognize experiences that I'm having, recognize experiences that you're having. No problem. The question is, what are they? Now, we do want to say that a certain form of consciousness exists, the one that consists in, this, in these phenomenal properties. Yes, we want to say that, that kind of consciousness exists, and we need to be absolutely robust about that. But don't just say consciousness exists because people will take the wrong message from that. Um, we do, however, define consciousness neutrally. Creature consciousness, consciousness uh, as, a, as, a, as a feature of organisms, it's just having experiences in the folk psychological sense. And we can all pick those out. We're all good at folk psychology. Mostly. State consciousness, if you want to have a notion of uh, consciousness that applies to mental states, I'll just say it's whatever distinguishes experiences in the sense of attentive seeing and so on from, say, subliminal perception, where some information is getting in that it's not, you, you can't introspectively recognize that you're, that you're in that state. So you have to do experiments to find out what you're subliminally conscious of. So, say, experiences, whatever. Uh, consciousness is whatever distinguishes those two. And of course, everyone's going to agree that a lot of those information and reactive processes, there's going to be big differences in those. There's some going on in the case of, of subliminal perception, but a vast amount more in the case of um, conscious experience. Uh, the question is, what else might be going on, if anything? So just do it in that way. What's on that again? Okay, another one, obvious one, don't try to solve the hard problem and other problems associated with phenomenal consciousness. Um, <laughs> not a problem, it doesn't exist. Hard problem is explaining these extra features. There aren't any extra fe features, there's no problem. Um, ah. So don't speculate about how the brain produces phenomenal properties, what causal role they have, how we know them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just don't, <laughs> just stop. Uh, uh, do something more useful. Uh, do focus on helping scientists to solve the easy problems. And the easy problems are the problems of spelling out that incredibly caricatured picture of informational loops that I gave, and informational reactive loops. Uh, that is an enormous problem, um, enorm not an enormous set of problems, but none of them deeply, deeply puzzling in the way that the hard problem is. They may require some theoretical innovation, of course they will, but they don't require a revolution in thinking about the na fundamental nature of reality. They don't require us to start supposing that uh, there are strongly emergent properties that, or that consciousness is a fundamental feature of the universe or anything like that. 
So mapping and explaining the information and reactive processes that constitute, oh, it's gone back, perceptual consciousness. Knew that, plenty of work to do there, and it will be useful. Uh, and also, so that's the uh, concern for the first order aspect, do try to solve the illusion problem, the problem of explaining why we believe, why so many people believe, and why so many people who don't believe attempted to believe in phenomenal realism. Explaining the nature and causes of the introspective illusion of phenomenal consciousness. Do read Michael Graziano's work. Great work uh, about how the brain models attention. Thinks that the, 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 the brain has uh, systems that monitor attention and model it and model it as something like a ghostly fluid that emanates from the eyes and latches onto things. And this modeling is what leads us attempts us into all kinds of dualistic beliefs about the mind. I think that picture is on the right lines, but it needs to be vastly extended. It's not just about modeling attention, it's about modeling a lot more than that. Uh, don't treat the note now, this is a bit more technical. Don't treat the notion of illusory phenomenality as a replacement for that of phenomenality. Don't think that whenever people ask questions about phenomenality, you can replace it with illusory phenomenality. But come up against this, this um, uh, this attitude, and it's misleading. Uh, it'll be easier to spell that out, I think, a bit later. But for instance, don't think that if people, if someone thinks that phenomenality is, a, is, is, is of ethical value, is of value, don't think that you can just then switch that ethical value over to the illusion of phenomenality. It doesn't work like that. And I'll try to explain why later. But for lots of, re, lots of, lots of things that people want to do with the notion of phenomenality, you can't do and shouldn't try to do with the notion of the illusion of phenomenality. Just trust me on that one. <laughs> um, and do help with the tasks below for other disciplines. Okay. Uh, so I'm talking a little fast, but I've got a lot to, I want to go in neuroscience. Well, don't search for the neural processes that correlate with phenomenal consciousness. There isn't such a thing as phenomenal consciousness. And anyway, searching for correlations isn't really what scientists should be doing. They should be searching for explanations and mechanisms. And correlations, correlations are cheap. All sorts of things correlate with other things. Um, I mean, attending this talk correlates with dying eventually, but you know. Um, anyway, it's a futile task because we can only correlate brain activity with reactions with reports, button presses, eye movements, pupil dilations, all sorts of things. That's all, you can, that's all you can find the neural correlates of. You can't find the neural correlates of something that's intrinsic and private. Even in the first person, you couldn't, even doing the experiments on yourself. You've always got to assume some specific correlation between the reaction, whatever the reaction it is you're, you're, you're testing, and phenomenal field. Just assume that a priori, based on a bit of philosophical uh, uh, well, from on its own reasoning, based on intuition, I think. Uh, and this means that every reaction you test for is a potential confounder. All you may be testing for there is the neural correlates of the reaction. You've got to assume that the reaction is a reliable sign of phenomenal consciousness. So you know, every reaction, everything you test for is a potential confounder. You cannot do science like that. It does, it's just, you're not, <laughs> So I'm, I'm, losing, I'm losing words here at my frustration with this approach. Do search for the neural processes that explain the responses, symptomatic of what we call consciousness, that explain some aspect of this cycle, some of these reactions that we generate. That's a tractable thing. It's something we know how to do, identify certain responses, yeah. experimental setups people in scanners, we do all sorts of things, and we look for the mechanisms that explain them, not for the correlates. We don't look for the, the gastric correlates of digestion. We look for how digestion works. Okay, a bit more from neuroscience. Don't assume that consciousness is a unified binary feature with a unified neural basis. That, that, that's, that's tempting because you think that these, 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 these extra features, these inner light as it were, is either on or off. There either is this redness there or there isn't. Might be very, very faint, but it's either there or it isn't. And that tempts to think of consciousness as binary. 
But what we have are massive information reactive processes that are not binary like that. They're completely graded. Do accept that consciousness is a hugely complex cluster of sensitivities and reactive dispositions layered upon each other, interacting in all sorts of ways, massively complex with different neural bases, different but overlapping probably neural bases. And do look for new, theoret better theoretically motivated taxonomies for kinds of consciousness. Devise frameworks for representing different forms and degrees of consciousness, different shapes that this complex of informational reactive cycles may take. Perhaps we might model them as locations in a multidimensional space, different forms of consciousness. I might even start, start attaching numbers to them, something like that. All theoretical notions. Okay, getting away from the idea that introspection and introspection of these strange properties somehow gives us a basis for taxonomizing what the brain is doing. Huh? Do explore how the brain constructs a sense of subjectivity and an illusion of phenomenality. Again, work such as Michael Graziano's, and do this comes to the same thing deconstruct the user illusion, work out how it works. Um, and why it's so powerful? Because it is powerful. Um, this is one of the things that illusion, one of the reasons for using the term illusion is to stress that this is a very compelling sense we have of there being this private world of ineffable properties. It's, we're not saying, look, you've just made a, a mistake here. It's just a bad bit of theory, a bit of philosophical theorizing, though I think it does involve that too. Uh, but I think that bad philosophical theory is built on something about the nature of human introspection that is pretty universal and pretty powerful and that strongly disposes people to go on and construct these philosophical edifices on top of it. That's the use of illusion that Dan talks about and that's what we need to deconstruct. Okay, so now let's, what are we doing? Okay. Uh, animal consciousness. I think some of the most interesting implications of illusionism come for thinking about animal consciousness. And the first thing we should do or stop doing is asking if animals are conscious to core. Stop thinking consciousness in this binary way. Stop thinking, stop asking if it's if it's like something to be a fish. Okay, we can see all the reactions of fishes as is, is, is displaying. We can uh, if we get in, you know, if we could get in a lab and do psychological experiments on it, we could we could tease those out in all sorts of, of, of ways. But still, it seems there's a mystery about whether it's actually feeling any of this whether the lights are on inside, whether it's like anything to be a fish. Don't ask that question. It's a bad question, it's an unanswerable question, and it's, it's going nowhere. Don't think of consciousness as analogous to an inner light. Don't assume that there is a sharp division of creatures into the conscious sheep and the non-conscious goats. This is, I, I wanna stress this actually though, my friend Nick Humphrey won't like this too much, but he's not here, so. Um, <laughs> And, and someone who is more sympathetic is, so I'm going to go ahead on, on this. Don't think of it like this, that um, in the course of evolution, uh, there was some point, or there could have been many different points, at which the inner lights came on, people and, and creatures got into this privileged realm of, of being conscious and all that lot were not conscious. And then they, they, they don't take any notice of where the, what creatures fall into which uh, things on the diagram, but do not think of it like that way. It's, it's, it's not only unhelpful, it's a positively distorting and pernicious way of thinking about animals. So do think of creatures as having different forms and grades of perceptual consciousness. Different kinds of informational and reactive loops. And what's more than loops, it's loops upon loops upon loops in interacting and, and uh, uh, looping back on each other and doing all sorts of fancy things. Do think of them as having different forms of that and different grades of it. And do map creatures distinctive patterns of sensitivity and psychological reaction. Start doing all the hard work instead of just looking at them and doing a bit of uh, reflection on your own intuitions about consciousness and saying, oh, I think they are, oh, I think they aren't. Identify the multi, uh, sorry, identify the similarities and differences between them and us along multiple dimensions. So get a picture of how their 
perceptual consciousness, the shape of their perceptual consciousness differs from the shape of ours. And then address ethical issue questions about how we should treat animals in the light of that knowledge. Now, don't do it. You know, I mean, I don't know what, what conclusions you should draw. Look at how similar their perceptual consciousness is to ours. We care about each other. We want, we care about some other creatures close to us. How far should we extend that concern? How should we, um, how, uh, how strong should that concern be? Think about it in the light of this knowledge, which is the only knowledge that's relevant. But it is very complex knowledge. Uh, it's going to be very hard to, to get it. Let's work on it. Oh, sorry, I, I missed something there. Uh, do read Leonard. Uh, Dang's paper, Does Illusions Imply Skeptical About an, um, Animal Consciousness? Very nice paper. What about introspective consciousness? Hang on a minute. What about introspective consciousness? Someone might say, here, look, that does seem to be binary, though, doesn't it? Look, either a creature's got it. I, the, the, that's the second loop. Either a creature has that or it doesn't have it. Now, we do seem to be back to something binary here. So maybe I am getting back a bit back towards Nick's position. I haven't told you what Nick's position is, but never mind. Um, so I've talked about the different shapes that this loop may have uh, in different creatures, but surely there's a binary issue of whether they have that as well. Well, and if introspective, I see him as introspective consciousness, if introspective consciousness is necessary for the illusion of phenomenality, am I then saying that the experiences of creatures without this, this extra loop are not like anything because they're not subject to the illusion. Don't think of introspective consciousness and the illusion of phenomenality in that way. Uh, don't think of this self-monitoring stuff as making the lights come on. I think some higher order representationalists do think of it in that way. They think that when you get this, you get real consciousness, real phenomenal consciousness. No, you don't. What you get is some sort of awareness of this and the ability to react to this. But that doesn't add something extra in a, of an intrinsic phenomenal kind. All you do is get the ability to recognize what's happening at this level and the ability to, to, to talk about it and to some extent control it. Think of self-monitoring as creating a further rough psychological reactions, including reports and beliefs about phenomenality. Now, animals don't display, don't report on their own experiences. No, they don't, but so what? They're still having the experiences. Doesn't mean those experiences don't matter just because they can't tell us about them. Just because they don't have the mechanisms to monitor it, them and tell us about them. Doesn't mean that their poor things are not, are not experiencing anything. They just don't have the higher order abilities required to control and communicate about those experiences. <laughs> Bless you. So do, do construe uh, Gesundheit, I should say. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's the Greek one. Uh, do construe talk of what experience is like, if you must talk about what experience is like, and it's, there's no harm in it as long as you construe it in the right way, that's characterizing this stuff. What this is. It, it, what your experience is like is what this stuff's doing. The shape of that pattern of, in, of informational sensitive, sensitivities and reactive dispositions, that's what your experience is like. That's how you're engaging with the world. Okay? So if anything qualifies as what experience is like, it's this stuff, whether or not you're monitoring. But uh, when we do talk about what it's like, we're talking about it metaphorically using the fiction of phenomena phenomenality, which is uh, created by the user illusion. Uh. So do conclude that the experiences of creatures lacking introspective consciousness are still like something in this non-phenomenal sense, which is the only sense that makes any uh, sense <laughs> anyway. So I think this perspective actually is a, um, uh, a, a, a liberal one towards animal consciousness. Okay, it's uh, there's no question of excluding some creatures from the privileged realm of consciousness. Uh, we can extend it 
as far as you want until it sort of gets so thin that it's kind of run out of any connection with our everyday usage and then we might stop but not because anything sort of radical is cut off but just because it's got so thin and it's either on a thermostat or something and you know that's one thing about country. okay ai uh, quickly because uh, i'm okay for a bit a little bit longer hmm. yeah okay ai the models here are fairly similar just don't worry about phenomenal consciousness. Just don't worry about it. Just stop thinking about it. <laughs> don't worry. Don't try to think about how you could create it. Don't worry about whether you might accidentally create it or have created it or whether it might create itself suddenly, spontaneously, when you weren't looking. I mean, it's futile. Anyway. The idea of creating it is futile anyway. Because if we kind of characterize consciousness with phenomenal consciousness if we can't characterize in functional terms and there's no way you can design a machine to produce it you go to the the engineer and say build a machine that has an intrinsic phenomenal character to experience it's just you can't draw a blueprint for that it's <laughs> you can't do it i mean that is the power that is the 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 practical analog of the the hard problem of the epistemic science it's the hard project trying to build something that you have no idea how to build and couldn't determine if you had built. <laughs> don't, don't, don't engage in that. Do focus on the easy, easy project of creating forms of perceptual consciousness, making robots that engage with significant features of their environment. Um, and uh, should, there should be a verb in there and generate and produce a, a range of appropriate responses where significant and appropriate are of course relative to the AI's purposes. Purposes, not purpose. Not purposes. Uh, don't ask if an AI is conscious, again, in this sort of binary way, like as we do with animals, no point in it. Just ask where a specific AI is located in the multi dimensional space of forms of, of perceptual consciousness that I talked about earlier. Get some theoretical framework for mapping different forms of perceptual consciousness and ask where this AI is, is in them. And of course, it might be very likely in regions that are not, not occupied by any uh, living creature. And draw the same morals about introspective consciousness as those for animals. It doesn't switch that make the lights come on, just provides a set of higher order control uh, functions, allows for communication about uh, the uh, uh, the, the creature's in engagement with the world. But do think about the value and risks of equipping AIs with introspective mechanisms that create the illusion of phenomenality, whether directly because you've decided that you wanted, you think that'd be a good thing to do for itself, or just as a side effect of other kinds of self monitoring. Uh, because there might be significant risks associated with giving AIs this sense of their being metaphysically special. Certainly Nick Humphrey thinks that evolution designed us to have this sense of having a, uh, a um, metaphysically special dimension to our own existence. He thinks that that changed our attitude to ourselves and to each other and to life in significant ways and might do the same with AIs. So be careful with it. Well, okay, we're getting, we're getting there. We're getting to the last section now, so ethics. This is something I want to say a little bit about here. Now, here's a quote from Galen Strauss. The great thing about Galen Strauss is that he provides such wonderful quotes for the illusionist. Uh, he, <laughs> so here we are. It's, this is from the exchange in the um, Europe, Europe book. Dennett's right. No one has ever really suffered in spite of agonizing diseases, mental illness. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm telling no one has ever caused anyone else pain. This is the great silliness. We must hope that it doesn't spread outside the academy. I suspect it already is outside the academy and it might be the normal, the default view of people who haven't been too much indoctrinated um, or convince some future informational technologist of roboticist. That's great power over our lives. Okay. Don't think like this. That's committing all the sort of errors I've just been, been pushing against the idea of the inner lights and these inner lights having a tremendous ethical significance for us. It's conceptualizing ethical value as rooted in that extra feature. So well, if you do that, and then you say, well, the extra feature isn't there, you say, well, I don't know. No, remember where we started. We started with the fact that experiences exist. 
and they are whatever they are, you know. I, I, have, I, I go into states that are pain states quite often. <laughs> you go into states that are, are pain states, and I can, I can tell when you do. Um, if, you, if I dropped something, a hammer on your toe, you were going to a pain state, and I would recognize immediately that I had, that you had, and I'd be able to just tell it by seeing it. Really. I can just, you know, behavior reveals this stuff very well most of the time. I mean, it's not saying it's sufficient. There's all sorts of internal reactions that are important too, but behavior reveals it very well. Anyway, so first of all, don't deny the existence of suffering of any other form of experience, folk psychologically characterized. Of course, of course, these states exist. The question is, what are they? That's what Dan says in his reply to, um, uh, to, uh, to Strawson. He says that, yes, yeah, Strawson is expressing a way that a lot of people think about consciousness, and it's a, it's a that way. And all we're proposing is a better way of thinking about it. Do you insist that experiences matter in the way we ordinarily take them to be? I don't think anybody thinks that pain matters because they're theoretically committed to phenomenal realism. Mm -hmm. I mean, people go, <laughs> they don't say, oh, okay, you're in one of those states we call pain. Now, because I dropped that hammer on your toe, but now I think that pain in involves a commitment to some extra features that are intrinsic and uh, distinct from all the information and reactive processes in your brain, and those are the sole source of ethical value. So I think what's happening in you doesn't, doesn't matter because you persuaded me that those things don't exist. Nobody does that, nobody thinks like that. Uh, let's say, experiences be identified recognitionally in both the first and third person. Do insist that illusionists merely offer uh, a different account of the nature of experience, of what's happening in these cases. And don't think that answers to questions about the value of experience depend on answers to questions about its nature. It's just part of our ordinary engagement with each other that we recognize these states and we care about them. That's just part of how we, what it is to be a human inhabiting the human world and interacting with it, having all the sort of reactive attitudes. Uh, that's what it is to be, to live as a human being, to recognize these states and care about them. Theories about the nature of these states philosophical theories or scientific theories, don't come into it. That's, that's down the line. Don't think of ethical value as grounded in phenomenality. This is where I may have some, I think Francois takes this worry more, more seriously than I do. I don't think, I don't think. It. And do develop alternative accounts of ethical value. And in fact, I think that'd be quite easy really because we have the everyday tools for doing it. I don't, um, I just sketched it there. But do read Francois's paper, The Normative Challenge for Illusionist Views of Conscience. Francois takes these words much more seriously than I do and thinks that we might have to uh, make some adjustments to our everyday ethical uh, judgments. Uh, I'm not persuaded of that. And I, 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 I it's credit to Francois for exploring this option. I think it needs, it's good to explore it, but ultimately I, I, I don't think it's the way to go. Also, and this is the last slide now, so we can <laughs> questions do highlight the positive ethical implications of illusionism. And I think this is an important thing. Do note that phenomenal realism tempts us, if it doesn't compel us, it certainly tempts us to believe that we can never really know what it's like to be someone else or some other creature. We can never know what it's like to be a bat. It's all hidden from us. So how much should we care for bats? The ethically significant facts are hidden from us in principle. So, you know, you just do a bit of, you just consult your intuitions, do a bit of philosophy and take a punt. Don't need to do that. We can identify all the ethically relevant facts. They're all out in the open. There are no radically private facts about experience. So as far as experience is related to ethical value, all the facts are in principle available for us. The relevant facts, I mean, in fact, we can, uh, we can do psychological experiments. Uh, it's a matter of finding what features of the world creature is sensitive to and how it reacts to them, and what features of its own experience it's sensitive to and how it reacts to them. And all that we can tease out with appropriate psychological experiments. It's very difficult to find the right protocols and so on, but so we think we can't do it. Besides the relevant facts, so they're detectable in principle and they're usually they're usually well revealed in behavior. I mean, we get on this way in our everyday life. We don't do psychological experiments on each other. We don't do philosophical uh, arguments with each other to work out whether we should care. 
you know, we've got it all in folk psychology. Just, just do it properly. Um, so the relevant facts are not private. They're always available in principle, provided we look long and carefully. So the final model, do look long and carefully at each other and at other creatures and at AIs. Look at them, see what their experience is like and decide how much you care about it. So that's the, the last of the do's and does. I know there are a lot and I apologize for that. Uh, I've got another bit of constructivist <laughs> art for that, art for you there, which I spent way too long doing this. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> I really, really did. Uh, um, well, I thought if the talk's bad, at least you, you like the images. And I also have a little, little thing for you, which I'll just leave up for, um, which is a little, um, a little um, lyric. You can guess the tune. Uh, I hope by then you'll all be willing to join in the chorus of, uh, of this together and endorse the sentiment there, which I like to think is in the spirit of the original, in the spirit of encompassing of our all being part of one world, not inhabiting private little realms of experience that are sealed off from everybody else, but all being creatures who are engaged with the world, engaged with our engagement with it, and who can engage with other people's engagement with it, if they look carefully enough at what it is. So imagine. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>